Hello everybody, Troy Ryan Wood here from the 3D Printing Doctor Who Project, wishing all of you a happy holidays. It's been a few months since my last video, so I thought I'd take a few moments to discuss some of the recent changes that have happened here at the project, as well as give you a brief sneak preview of some of the brand new figures I'm working on for 2020. The goal of this project is still the same, to fill in the gaps of the official 5.5 inch scale character options toy range with free 3D printable custom action figures that you can print, paint, assemble, and display at home. A few months ago, I upgraded from using a regular FDM filament printer to the Anycubic Photon, which is an SLA resin printer that retails for about 300 pounds in the United Kingdom. The Photon, or the Elegoo Mars, which is even cheaper at 230 pounds, are two of the most affordable and easiest to use machines on the market. Both have nearly identical print areas of about 2.5 inches by 4.5 inches by 6 inches high, so I've made that the new standard for parting out all of my future figures. Now an important piece of this project is making my designs as simple and easy to print as possible regardless of what type of machine you happen to own. So this doesn't mean that I'm abandoning filament printing. What it does mean is that I have to make some slight changes to my design process so that all my figure templates will be compatible with either method of printing. Filament and resin have very different physical properties. Filament is slightly flexible and compresses when you squeeze it, so it's possible to make simple pop together joints that require no additional parts, and this is how I assembled my first 25 figures. Uh, SLA resin is completely rigid and very similar to glass. The rigidity means that you get an astonishing amount of surface detail on your prints, but it has absolutely no give to it, and if you try to twist or compress a resin part, it'll break before it bends. Filament printers are basically giant glue guns that lay down small crisscrossing threads of plastic to weave a printed object together. They really do not like underhangs or parts smaller than about 5 millimeters in width, and both of these tend to look pretty ugly once you remove the support structures. Resin printers print upside down in a vat of liquid UV sensitive resin and print each layer of your print simultaneously. This means that they're way faster than filament printers and the resolution is far superior, but because you're dealing with a liquid, you have to consider fluid dynamics when orienting your print and creating your support structures. If you create a cup-shaped structure or a tube that isn't open on one end, it can trap liquid resin inside during the print process, making parts that should be hollow solid. Primarily because of resin's inflexibility, I've had to get creative with my joint design, and I've taken some inspiration from the old G.I. Joe toys of the 1980s, which have surprisingly good range of articulation for being made out of almost entirely hard plastic. I've started implementing a plug-in sheath design for neck and shoulder joints that can be printed out, slotted together, and then glued into a cylinder-shaped hole into the torso. For hinge joints like knees and elbows, I've had to think outside the box and incorporate these 1.5mm brass rods. These are a common size used by model airplane makers, and if you can't find them at your local hobby or hardware store, you should be able to get them fairly cheap online. If you get really desperate, you can also substitute a thin wire coat hanger or nail though you may need to carefully drill out the hole to make them wide enough to fit. Assembly is pretty easy with the brass rods. Just stick the rod in from the side through both pieces, mark it with a pen or pencil, then cut it with a pair of wire cutters about a millimeter or two shorter than where you made your mark. Then use a small tube or eyedropper full of UV resin to fill in the hole on the open side, locking the rod in place and making it invisible after painting. If you look at the 3D Printing Doctor Who website and go to the templates page, you'll see that it's now got a handy grid layout showing what types of 3D printing material each of my figures are designed to work with. My goal for 2020 is to go back and finish retrofitting all 25 of my previous figures so that they'll be compatible with both filament and SLA resin printers. In most cases, when you download the files off of Google Drive, there will be a separate folder or file name for PLA or SLA variants, and you can just select whichever one you need. You'll also notice the templates page has a third column labeled Flex SLA, which is a different type of SLA resin that's flexible like rubber, depending on the thickness of the part. For some figures with very thin limbs, like the Zarbi or Wern, I recommend printing those pieces with flexible resin so that they're less likely to snap off and break if they get dropped or played with too hard. There are also a handful of figures with retractable limbs, like Alpha Centauri, the Servo Robot, and the Crotons, that will only work if you print with those parts in flexible SLA or regular filament. Printing with flexible SLA can be somewhat tricky and it's about twice as expensive as regular SLA, so I try not to use it as much as possible. Uh, I do plan on going back and making alternate non-retracting versions of those figures that can be printed either way at some time in the coming year. Now that I've worked out most of the kinks in resin printing articulation, it's time to show off some of the latest figures on the 3D printing assembly line. 
Now, none of these are fully assembled or painted yet, but I'll do a separate video for them in the new year once I've had a chance to put them together and pretty them up. My 26th figure is the Toymaker robot from the William Hartnell episode, The Celestial Toymaker. Here's a semi-assembled resin printed version. This was something of an odd figure to sculpt since pretty much all the surface detail is completely flat and just painted on. I still wanted to give people something of a guide to show how to paint it, so I compromised and made the surface detail very slightly raised, less than a millimeter. Um, you can just barely see the outline here on the resin printed version, and I'm not even 100% sure it'll show up on the filament version. Since we're missing all but the final episode of the Celestial Toymaker, it's hard to get a sense of how well the robots moved or if they even moved at all. The two props designed by Shawcraft appear to be static without a person inside them, but we do know that they were poseable from a few publicity stills taken during filming. So I've given them at least basic articulation of the arms and the legs. For the chest screen, I've used a process similar to the TARDIS monitor in the 8th Doctor TV movie console room playset, where we've got an LED light brick that slots in from behind, followed by a regular paper printed gobo that I've covered in clear packing tape. This goes behind the screen, when you turn on the light brick with the antenna sticking out of the top of the head, it displays the Doctor's current score in the Trilogic game. For those who don't want to use the LED light brick, there's also an alternative front panel that just has the plain painted dials. The screen versions were used during most of filming, but they do appear to be a few scenes where the dial versions were visible in Episode 2. Figure number 27 is one I've wanted to do for a very long time. It's the Mark VII Robotic Cleaner from Paradise Towers. As you can see here, it's more or less fully assembled, uh, still needs to be painted, and I still need the wheels. It has fully articulated claws, drill, and saw blade. The figure also comes with this optional wheelie bin accessory, currently minus its wheels and ignore this printing defect, that will have a uh, extra pair of legs that you can stick out at the back and pretend to have a yellow Kang or caretaker corpse in the back. In addition to the wheelie bin accessory, I also plan on making an alternate uh, arm joint here at some point so that you can have two alternate arms, the one that out stretches and can grab stuff, and then one that is bent inwards so that you can be in the resting position. And I said, and this just comes straight off. In addition to that, you also have a Lego pullback motor inside. Uh, this is a very standard issue Lego pullback motor. I've got all the parts that are listed on the website. Uh, this is an older model pullback motor because it has a slightly more torque than most of the modern ones. Uh, but it's still fairly easy to find. Uh, the motor, you've got your Technic wheels and uh, tires here. Um, you can actually, uh, you will have an option to print the wheels and, uh, and tires as a uh, 3D printed piece. Really all you absolutely have to have is the pullback motor. Uh, but I said, this is still a fairly common part to find. You can get them on eBay, uh, Bricklink, and a number of other places for like a buck. So they're pretty common. This leads us into figure number 28, which started out as just an accessory for the cleaner robot. But as I started building it, I ended up expanding on it and turned it into its own full size figure. This is Croagnon, also from Paradise Towers. Uh, though oddly, this is the version that you don't actually see in the episode. Um, really, in the televised production, all you see or ever see are the lights uh, and a bit of fog. So this one started out as a bit of a mystery, since we know very little about what the Croagnon prop truly looked like, as it was only ever shown on screen in tight close-up shots and with tinted lighting. Uh, and unfortunately, the only behind-the-scenes photos I have from, are from the front and in black and white, and they're still mostly obscured by the smoke. So this is sort of a best guess of what I figure the prop probably looked like. From the set photos, we can sort of tell that the triangular console piece was more or less the same layout as the uh, console panel seen in the uh, Resi's flat, in that the lights were probably orangish and the downward facing triangles were probably a darkish purple. We also know that the desk is C-shaped and has some, uh, what I'm assuming appear to be uh, four inch round uh, hemispheres, actually the exact same as what are used on the uh, Daleks, uh, lining the top row. Um, I put a couple of extra down below. Um, it's, again, while you can't clearly see them in the smoke, uh, 
it is implied that there are some directly below the lip of the upper surface and uh, they and also kind of give the uh, the figure a bit of a face look kind of they kind of look a little bit like teeth and I'm sure that's what they were going for the uh, the lower surface area of the of the desk is also made out of the same uh, grid material as the cylinder that descends on the chief caretaker so I tried to model that as best I could um, again even with resin you can only get down so small before the detail just vanishes so this gives the impression of the uh, the circuit the alternating circular pattern figure number 29 I don't want to say too much about right now because it's still very early in the design and development process um, those who are part of the 3d printing doctor who Facebook group uh, probably know what I'm working on next uh, as I've talked about it a bit on there but uh, it's still very much an experiment and I'm not a hundred percent sure it'll actually work even with resin printing so continue watching this space hit subscribe and don't forget to follow the project on Facebook and Instagram if you want to be among the very first to know what new figure I plan on releasing next well that's all for now happy holidays Incidentally, Merry Christmas to all of you at home Yeah.